I'll say what. I also um, have worked in radio and television and still do. Um, for about 30 years, I, I owned and worked with the biggest film and video library on the history of the America's Cup, including representing the, uh, the library for the Mystic Seaport Museum in, uh, over in Connecticut, uh, making documentaries and editorials and, and various uh, vignettes and so forth for broadcasters and sponsors like Louis Vuitton and Moet and so on. I am a member of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron, and just for those who uh, didn't pick up what I was saying a little bit earlier on, um, on the America's Cup before we get into the Garden of Evil, uh, the American Magic, it was announced yesterday, the New York Yacht Club's um, challenge for the next Cup is withdrawing from New Zealand. Um, they're folding up their camp here, dismantling their boat and what have you, and sending it off somewhere overseas. Uh, and that course, uh, sometime around the end of March, we're expecting to learn where the next venue for the America's Cup is. And no doubt um, you could imagine a lot of very disappointed Kiwis here that the Cup won't be held here in New Zealand next time. Anyway, um, so on to the film, The Garden of Evil. I, I hope you've all had that chance to see it, and um, I'll take any questions a bit later on. So you can use your message uh, on, on Zoom to send me any, any, any questions that you might have. The film is an investigative story of crime and um, in the Brazilian Amazon, and um, with an environmental backstory. Um, I was actually in the Peruvian Amazon back in 1975 and had a pretty bad experience myself. So I had huge respect for um, just how dangerous this place can be. So when this opportunity came up, I leapt at the chance to go back to the Brazilian Amazon, and uh, this time with a, with a lot more security than I had back in 75. But I'm often asked why did I come up with the idea to make this film? And um, why did I produce it? What was the point in dredging up this very painful Kiwi story of nearly, oh, it is 20 years ago now? Um, firstly, I, I knew and respected Peter Blake, and I'd followed him as a journalist around the world on many of his ocean racing campaigns, and uh, of course, his two successes with the America's Cup winning in San Diego in 95 and defending it in 2000. So when it was reported that he had been killed by pirates in the, you know, in the heart of the Amazon, the local media uh, were first to come out. They suspected that there was something far more sinister than had been reported, that it was at the heart of this whole murder scene. There was something far more sinister. And um, I sort of picked that up quite early in the piece. And I wondered once, once it was just sort of reported after they'd caught these pirates and convicted them and jailed them and so on, what really was, had gone on behind the scenes? Well, there was a young journalist in Sao Paulo who had been commissioned to go and meet the killer in the prison in Macapá. Blake was killed. In a, in a, just outside a town called Macapá, about 75 miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. He'd been up the river for two and a half months, and he was on his way out. And they'd cleared customs that day, and they were leaving the next morning. They'd gone ashore and had a few drinks and got back to the boat, and about 10 o'clock at night they were invaded by these guys. Um, there were reports of between four and eight people that had boarded the boat. But um, we got a better idea now of really um, how many there were and who they were. But um, that pricked my curiosity anyway to um, get to the bottom of what actually happened on December the 5th, 2001. There have been mixed rumours that the Mafia uh, and or organised crime were involved. But that was never actually substantiated. Uh, the, the lads that were caught, and they were all young 
young lads that were drug addicts and they were um, sort of hired guns as it were. Uh, they would sell their kids for ten dollars, their children for ten dollars. They do a, a murder for five dollars. I mean, you know, it was, it's one of the most dangerous places on earth, outside of a war zone. The other reason f um, for me to make this film is that I, like many of us, a great fan of Sir David Attenborough and the wonderful documentaries on nature that he's made, the beautiful television series that. Um, have fascinated people all over the world and with the growing understanding of climate change and how important protection of our environment is um, and this is and it, this, this whole film really and this is one of the reasons why Blake went to the Amazon in the first place but um, it was a pathway that he would choose after he'd retired from his yacht racing and his America's Cup campaigns in 2000 um, his, from his own experience in racing around the world, he was always concerned at the health of the oceans and the, and the waterways, plastic pollution and extinction of marine life and so on. Um, it, it, and it is even worse today than it was 20 years ago, as you know. So it was one of those things that I, I'd been encouraged to do something about this by Donald McIntyre, an English Irish journalist who uh, is a criminologist. And he was in the Amazon due to board Blake's boat the following day after he was, uh, the, the night that he was murdered. That, it was a BBC program that they were going to be filming with Blake. And they, um, they were a day late, so they, they, Blake was killed and they missed the opportunity. But he did his own investigation and believed sincerely that there was something far more sinister about this. And Donald spoke to me about it and suggested that um, we have another look at it, and take a, a really close look and go and meet the, um, the bandits, the pirates, and particularly the killer, that one guy, young Tavares, now 42, um, in the prison where he still is at Macca Park. But, um, as you, as, I mean, just sort of getting back to the environmental aspect of the thing, as you, those of you who have seen the film, in the opening scene of the, uh, the film, Sir David Attenborough has uh, lent his quote, um, which we picked up from a United Nations speech in Poland in 2017, where he said, you know, right now we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. And if we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. So he and Blake, he sort of um, picked up something that Blake had, had written some years before. So he and Blake were selling the story to those who would listen. And around 2000, the global warming story was still not really getting the traction uh, that it now has. And they were saying, you know, if we lose the rainforest of the Amazon, we lose 20% of the world's oxygen and a large portion of its biodiversity. Well, the fact is that the Amazon consumes almost all of its, the oxygen it produces. It certainly is a carbon sink, and that's important. So if, as some scientists predict, that the Amazon could be gone in 50 years, it's the climate and environment that will be affected. And certainly in South America, the Caribbean, and, and, and in parts of your own country, the United States. And it's already happening now. Droughts, storms, all these things are starting to affect the locality of, uh, of the Amazon. And um, that's a great concern. Yet, you know, the question that I've always sort of had about that is who's really listening? You know, we hear about what the scientists are telling us and how important it is and all the great promises that we're going to reduce uh, the carbon in the atmosphere and so on but just too few I, I think too few are really listening and the decimation of the rainforest uh, is happening at an alarming rate uh, and we witnessed it ourselves and filmed it ourselves um, all for just financial gain greed um, of you know a relative few really and of the two and a half million odd square miles 
of rainforests since the 1970s, nearly a third of it has been wiped out. And that's just uh, incredible. So in a, in a matter of 30 years, you know, if you can imagine in 50 years from now, if it continues the way it goes, it'll just be savannah. And it's all just driven by commercial interests or short-term goals and no regard for the long, you know, the long-term effects. So I think, you know, that it's important that, the, that we all understand really how important these rainforests are all around the world. So when Blake was, um, w he was only 52 um, when he was murdered. Um, so he was really just in any, any sort of a prime of his retirement. Um, and he had finished with his yacht racing clear as I, career, as I said, um, you know, with that successful defence in 2000. And I was intrigued to learn at the time that Jacques Cousteau's foundation, the Cousteau Foundation, which is based in Monaco, headed up by Madame Cousteau, was, um, the oceanographer's wife, asked Peter Blake if he'd be interested in picking up where Jacques left off. And Blake had, Blake had always been interested in the ocean and, and, you know, the high seas and the marine life and so on. So he was interested, but unfortunately one of the Cousteau family challenged this appointment. So Blake went out on his own and acquired Seamaster. It's about a hundred foot, big, ugly down, uh, beast of a, of, of a yacht, um, and went out on his own. Got a big sponsor, an Amiga, and um, they named the yacht Seamaster after one of the Amiga watches. And um, I'm not sure of the overall length, but I think it's about a hundred feet. So he was one year into a five year boy zone adventure to the pulse points of the planet to film his findings. It wasn't necessarily scientific, but he was an appointed United Nations special envoy for the environment. And that whole idea was that he would be reporting on his findings. The last time I spoke to Peter was at the 150th Jubilee of the America's Cup. Um, 2001 and um, in cows in England and it was quite by chance that I was uh, walking along the dock where many of the historical yachts were such as Australia 2 and, and many other 12 meters and a few old J boats and so on but being one of a group of, uh, of those great American America's Cup characters and skippers he was there to um, really promote what he was doing with his adventure to his next stop from the Amazon because he'd already spent some months down in the Antarctic. So a few months later in December that year, um, I remember where I was when the shocking news broke that Sir Peter Blake had been murdered by pirates in the Amazon. I'd been filming a story about a French aeroplane in Dijon in France and was on my way back to Paris, it was a very wet and cold day, and uh, got off the train, the TGV at Garden Or, in the heart of Paris, and I uh, jumped into a taxi uh, to take me back to my hotel. It was about five to four in the afternoon, and at the top of the hour, the four o'clock radio news broke on the taxi's radio, in French of course, but I picked it up that Sir Peter Blake had been murdered that this famous New Zealand yachtsman, Peter Blake, has been murdered in the Amazon. It was all over the news that night. On kind of blue, CNN had it, BBC was running it. It was accepted, really, that this was a planned robbery by this group of pirates, and that there was, and that's really where it sort of lay for about 16 years. Until in September 2017, I read an article in a local newspaper here, the Sunday Star Times, the article was written by uh, an English journalist living in Sao Paulo. He had been commissioned to go to the prison and interview Blake's killer, this young chap, Tavares. He did the interview with this guy, and um, in that story, one glaring statement spiked my interest again, got me thinking about there's something behind this other than just these young dudes targeting this boat. So the still imprisoned Ricardo Colares Tavares is his actual name. 
he's still in prison, but he's due to be released this year. But he refused to answer a question about who, if anyone else, was behind the attack of Seamaster. He effectively said that there's much more to tell, but I'm not going to reveal it now. So he wasn't given a chance, he says, to tell his side of the story. But I think we, he was angling to get the reporter to come back. But anyway, that was another point. So I got hold of um, Sam Cowie, was his name, in, in Sao Paulo, and um, asked him, could I see his notes? It was, um, it was absolutely fascinating, because Tavares was clearly trying to hide something. And um, even Donald McIntyre, who's a um, criminologist, said, you know, prisons and the likes of Brazil, which are really pretty bad, um, these guys wouldn't be telling you who was really behind it because their lives would be at risk. They'd probably be murdered in prison. Because a lot of the organized crime, criminal heads of, of these crime groups are actually in jail anyway. So, so whether Tavares was telling the truth or not, the fact is that he was in the company of this extraordinary character who has spent well nearly uh, well, 20 years now in prison, openly answering some very probing questions as to what happened that night in December the 5th. Well, that really got me going. So that was the, the main reason for it. So I, I got hold of um, Donald McIntyre again and asked him whether he would be prepared to help me co-produce this this production. So we went to Brazil. I went to the prison with our crew, a New Zealand crew. And we sat down. It took us about six months, incidentally, to organize and get the authorities' approval to go into the prison, including his own approval, of course, um, and a lot of money. We paid everybody, the lawyers, the, um, the prison guards, Tavares, his mother, his father, his sister, everybody that wanted, that had a say in it, all had to be paid. So in a total of about a hundred thousand US dollars before we'd even got to, before we'd even got to the Amazon. But um, yeah, so we eventually get there and they ask him this. You know, the, the very fundamental question, you know, who was really behind this? Are you prepared to talk now? And he beat around the bush for about four hours. But in total, we had five days there inside this prison. They gave us complete carte blanche. We could do what we liked. We'd go where we wanted, film what we wanted. We had drones going down these grotty, horrible cell blocks. Um, and you'd have seen them in the film. Uh, we had the complete open slather. We could do whatever we wanted there, which really surprised me. And I'd had a list of things that I, my wish list, that I was going to hit them with and thinking I might get one or two of these, but anything we wanted, they let us do. So we, we, we shot the film and um, in over two years, I had two different trips to the Amazon. We had three months in the first and two months in the second trip. We've spent three weeks living with the Mandaruku because um, we wanted to find out what was really going on in the jungles with the with the murders, the many, many murders, hundreds of murders every year of the indigenous people. How they were trying to protect it, how they protected their lands and what was really involved with their protection. Um, nobody was protecting them, so they were setting up their own vigilante groups. Um, we went to the northern part of the Amazon, up to Jijua, and we lived with some river people and another indigenous group who had another story. <clears throat> they too, from the north, are now starting to see what they call the the herringbone creep, is where all of the um, the illegal logging is chopping down and burning out the um, burning out the, the rainforest. It's starting to now head into the northern part, closer to Venezuela, where we were. So it was um, a real eye-opener. But at the same time, um, it was truly spectacular. It is one of the most amazing places on this planet. You could imagine what it would have been like when there was just dinosaurs around. No man. It's just beautiful. 
ironically, there's about 30 million people living in that. And uh, about 350 indigenous, of those 350 indigenous tribes are quite small. But there's about 30 million plus living in the Brazilian Amazon. So wherever you go, there's people, which has its own problems with pollution of the rivers. One of the things that Blake was really interested in. But um, the story goes that Blake had had um, two and a half months up the Amazon studying, taking photographs, sending out information about what he was seeing back to the United Nations on a satellite phone. The other thing that he did when he went onto the Amazon was that he, he told the authorities where he was going and wanted to check in with them on a day-to-day -day basis so that they could keep an eye on them because it is dangerous up there. And even though Blake had a, um, a US, an ex-US Navy SEAL on board the boat with two guns, they had two 308 rifles on board for security, um, they had to be very careful and he was aware that it could be really dangerous. So he had been up there two and a half months. They wanted to originally go through to the Orinoco River in Venezuela, come out into the, um, into the Caribbean. But there's a little canal between the uh, Rio Negro River and the, um, and the Orinoco. And it was a particularly low river that, at that time, so they couldn't get Seamaster through. So he took the young crew off, it's six of them, including the doctor and the security guy off the off Seamaster, turned around and went back out towards Macapa where they anchored the night that he was killed. And the rest of the guys went through on a um, on a catamaran, a rafted catamaran, through the Casaquari and into and into the Orinoco. And the idea was that Blake was then going to go up through the Atlantic and pick them up on the other side, go back up the Orinoco and meet them. So, um, in summary, I sort of found pretty good reason to make the story, even to the point of um, confronting Sir David Attenborough. Um, I met him in London. He was committed to a BBC series, so he wasn't prepared to, we well, couldn't be seen, but he was certainly interested in, in allowing us to use that contribution, which is at the beginning of the film. So he's become quite a, a fan of ours, which is um, great. I'd like to be able to work with him again. So as I said earlier, hundreds are killed every year in the Amazon. Um, it's not, you know, the drug thing is really big, but gold, um, the illegal logging is massive. The burning of the forests is massive. There's over 800,000 square kilometers. I think that would be right about four 400,000 miles, square miles, I guess, that it's been ripped out over the last 30 years. So it's um, it's pretty bad. And um, yeah, so we've made the film as a feature to uh, firstly to be seen in the cinemas in New Zealand. We released it on uh, the 4th of November here in New Zealand, but the country, half the country was locked down. So <laughs> Most of the theatres were closed. We got it into about 30 screens uh, as opposed to 90. Uh, so it wasn't a true success here in New Zealand, but it's now being negotiated with a major streamer for a worldwide distribution. Um, and hopefully we've nailed that in the next week or so. Um, it was just sort of one other thing. I think that we, we were lucky to get out of um, the Amazon before the pandemic struck. So we were very fortunate to get all our filming done uh, before there was any sort of restrictions anywhere. But uh, one of the things that we, we, we noticed that, you know, during the making of the film that over 200 activists, including the indigenous people of the Amazon, have been killed while we're there well, in the making of that film. So that's pretty, pretty awful. Um, I've sort of... Um, now, any of you that have got any questions, please um, put them up. Let me see what I can I can see here. I've got a few of my own that I sort of uh, thought you might be interested in that I've used myself in various um, publicity things that I've been asked to do to promote the film. 
where are you here? Let me see if there's any of your questions up here. Into full screen. How many have we got, by the way? How many people have we got on board? About 20. Okay. Oh, great. Larry, okay. one of the questions I've been asked, obviously, is may we see the film? I know that you have sent me a link to the film and you have indicated that everybody on this call, everybody who's in attendance can, uh, yeah. Yeah. can, can see the film. Yes, you can see do the you film. Have any, do you have any restrictions on... You can, you can see the film, you can go into the Vimeo with the link and there's a password, you can get to the film. Um, you need to see the film within the next four or five days because the password will change. So um, by all means, see the film. Um, you, it'll, um, I can't remember, have you given me the password? I'll send it to you again, I have, but I will send it to you again. Okay, great. The other question I have, Larry, is, is this film available and to whom and are you i just think it it's a fantastic film i think everybody should see it i think it's uh it just has a great impact you've you've uh done a great job of, 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 of telling the story but um is there anything we can do to, to enable this film to be available widely uh, not a, well. Thank you for the thought. But, um, not really at this point. Um, but once the uh, once the agreement with either Netflix or Amazon Prime, they're probably going to one of those two will pick it up. Once that is um, expired, um, which would probably be in three years, but I can use it for fundraisers. So if you have a fundraising opportunity for the club um, with the, you know, the view of maybe, you know, cleaning up the oceans, thinking about, you know, the environment and so on, more than happy for you to have the film um, and raise some money. We've just done a, um, a fundraiser here for um, uh, muscular sclerosis. One of my one of my directors, is, um, his daughter just died of it. So we just raised about I think that's $25,000 that for that on that film. So they filled the theater up um, a couple of times to do that. So, yeah, I mean, you can think about that in the future, but um, by all means, talk about it. I'm more than happy for you to, um, to talk about it. Because it is an unusual film, given that it really focuses crime. Most stories that are made about the Amazon are really nice stories that are about the animals and the biosphere and how important it is to the environment that the likes of David Attenborough makes. And here's a story about the Amazon showing the dark side of the story, how really dangerous it is. Um, I mean, the animal life is amazing. And the, and the forests are just gorgeous. Yet beneath the canopy of all of that is an incredibly dangerous place. But um, certainly the cities, anyway. But uh, the, the indigenous people are just beautiful. They're just really lovely people. But, um, one of the things that I'd like the audience to really take away from this is, you know, that greed, ignorance, selfishness, and high, high crime really are at the heart of the planet's environmental issues. And that Blake's death was really just one high-profile example of the many who have been killed every year and are killed every year. You know, trying to bring about greater awareness of the depth of the issues of uh, feeding, I guess, the levels of criminality um, that's exploiting the Amazon's rich resources. And it is incredibly rich in resource. Um, Blake recognized this from years, of, as I said, r racing around the ocean. So um, it's something that I've now learned <clears throat> and I've become a true environmentalist myself. Um, and I'm going back, we're going to make an, another series. So um, I'm going back there as soon as the pandemic is over. But um, that's what I'd like you to take away from this film, just how important protecting the environment is. Um, you know, one of the questions is, you know, do you believe that the biggest threat of our planet is deforestation of the Amazon? Well, it's one of the biggest. 
but it's not the only threat. You know, deforestation throughout the equatorial forest, rainforest belt right around the world, Indonesia, Africa, and, uh, all those areas. It, it's it's a very important very important part of, of trying to protect our atmosphere. Um, and the waters, of course. You know, one of the things that we've noticed here in New Zealand has started to happen now. I mean, there's more awareness now of people dumping rubbish in the oceans, including bottles, like glass bottles. Don't do it. Um, I know they say it'll eventually turn into sand and so on, but it's um, it's not a good example for anyone that actually sees you do it. But plastics are just hor horrifying problems with, with plastics. As you know, there's an eddy in the middle of the of the Pacific Ocean that's about the size of Texas. Um, and the, there's a question here, is, you know, will your film answer the question about Tavares as a river pirate or something far more sinister? Well, you'll have to see the film to get that answer. If you haven't, if you have seen the film, you'll have got, you'll have worked it out yourself. Um, but um, Blake's Killer is a product of the exploding poor population, you know, population there. You know, and they're enticed into that area by promises of prosperity. Um, and, the, and, the, and the cities are getting bigger and bigger. I mean, Manaus is two and a half million people in Manaus. And in Macapá, where we spend a lot of the time, there's 500,000 people there. And it's just getting bigger. And the reason it's getting bigger is because the criminals the organized criminals that are coming out of the city are, are the ones that need these people to chop the, the trees down. So um, here's another one. What, what improved environmental hope will, will, I, will this film give my audience? Well, I hope that it's, um, I hope that it's really a lasting. I think that it's, it's not a film you'll, it's a film you, you couldn't say you'll enjoy this film because it's actually a really dark story. But you will come out of it, I think, with um, a lot more knowledge and awareness that that's not just a beautiful place. It actually is very dangerous, and that um, it's important that we we really look after it somehow. Uh, what legacy would you like to leave as a result of this film? Well, that's our moments of struggle that um, divine uh, us all really. Um, but it is not what I leave for others that matters. It's um, it's what um, what you see. What you see will impact you enormously. And I think that this film being the only film that's ever been made out of the Amazon that is truly of a major crime, a series of crimes, is um, quite shocking. So I think that's sort of really where I'm at there. Um, if there are any other questions that you might have. What have we got there, Brad? This is interesting doing a um, <laughs> doing a talk on a on a Zoom call. I want to make sure that I uh, do a shout out to Chicken Alexis Pyle, who are the ones who <clears throat> brought you to our attention, and I'm incredibly grateful because the impact of your film, Larry, uh, is what we are doing collectively, indirectly, uh, without our full knowledge yeah. uh, to the planet. And this Correct. film gets right to the heart of that. Yes, it's about a murder of a very famous fellow, sailor, but the impact to me is what we're doing to the planet. And, and, and so I will send a link uh, Larry, as soon as you send me that password, I'll, I'll send a link to everyone on the call. Yeah, sure. And, uh, make sure that uh, you you want to you you want to re you want to see this film. Yeah, I'm. I'm um, um, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all, and um, I hope um, you do get to see the film and um, that it does have an impact on you. Hey, Larry, uh, good seeing you and uh, sorry not to see Debbie. And uh, next time we see you, I hope it's in person, uh, either me casa or su casa. Well, yeah, you can come here anytime. Yeah. Probably easier for you to come to New Zealand. Us getting out of here is like jail. Yeah. <laughs> we almost, when we went in 2020, we almost didn't get out. Yeah. Oh, really? 
We missed you. In a day. Well, come, we'd love to see you back again, and I can't wait to get back to, um, to California. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Come see us. Will do. To Thank Jeff you. And Ashley. Yep. And um, good luck to you all, and um, stay safe. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. It was great. Always. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And Bye. thanks before for the we, opportunity. Before we end, can I ask, ask who Galaxy S10 Plus is so I can send this to you? Okay. Sorry. But <laughs> oh, you're not. Anyway, uh, Larry, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful to have you. I'm so glad that uh, we had you and, and that you made this film. It, again, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you all. See you again. Bye. See you, Chick. Alexis. <laughs>